Sí. A Marco, così sei davanti alla telecamera. No? Siediti qua, Marco. È il mio posto, siediti qua. So, let's get started and uh, good morning everyone. On behalf of the European Economic Association, welcome to the inaugural lecture of the first European job market. We are very excited to see you all in Naples and it is an honor that uh, Jean Tirol has uh, accepted to deliver this lecture. For those of you who have followed the job market uh, in its early phases and watched our promotional video, you will know that Jean has been one of the most persuasive and enthusiastic supporters of this initiative. So we are really thankful uh, for that. And I have asked uh, Marco Pagano, who's uh, the chair of the local organizing committee at the uh, Università Federico II di Napoli, to introduce Jean in a proper way. So what I'll do is still a couple of minutes because I really want to thank uh, some people for making this job market happen. So on the academic side, I have to start with uh, my fellow co-presidents, uh, Hietil Stories Latin and uh, uh, Antonio Cabrales, who is here, be, for believing in this and for really helping the association to push this forward. Uh, I also want to thank Christian Helwig and Sarah Smith, who joined the working group on the job market when we planned it, and uh, Tim Besley, president of the Econometric Society, uh, again for allowing us to partner with the society and, and with the winter meetings of the Econometric Society. Then many of you uh, helped us spread the word. You know, this is an effort that requires coordination. So it was very, very important to get people together and commit to come to this market. And there were two people I really want to mention in particular, who were Roland Strauss um, from the Society of German Speaking Economists and Michael Herman from the Central Bank Research Association, who really in the early stages believed and uh, you know, helped us gather a lot of support for this. Now, of course, the members of the local organizing committee at the University of Naples have done a lot more than just the logistics. So Marco Pagano, Tullio Iappelli, Gabriella Graziano has been incredibly you know, um, helpful and part of our team, uh, really. And speaking of organizations and logistics, many of you must have been in touch with Gemma Pruner-Thomas, who's the manager of the EA. She put in an incredible amount of effort and dedication, and we really owe her a lot. And uh, Maria Carannante and Stefania Maddaluno have you know, worked a lot uh, hidden, but uh, they were equally crucial in making this smooth. At least my understanding is that nobody has come to me complaining really, really hard up to this point. And uh, last but not least, our sponsors. Um, we know how important support uh, and not, not only moral and scientific support is. So the Unicredit Foundation, the Bank of Italy, and the ECB uh, deserve all our gratitude. We are confident that this initiative is going to continue. It's, it got off to a really good start. So next year, it will be held, uh, the job market, in Rotterdam on December 1920. And we are merging the UK job market formally so that the Royal Economic Society will uh, discontinue its December event. The following year, the market will be in Nottingham. And we are discussing just these days with the Spanish Economic Association to try and achieve a complete merge, possibly already starting next year. So I think uh, these are really hopeful uh, developments that uh, the European Economic Association is excited about, and uh, to the candidates and the recruiters who have uh, uh, believed in this from the first uh, effort, uh, um, we want to uh, express our gratitude. Now, I think I stole enough time from the real reason you are all here, so let me give the floor to Marco um, to introduce John. Thank you, Eliana. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, 
organizing all this, and thank you to Jeanne uh, uh, for coming over here, uh, starting uh, the European job market uh, with the blessing of Jean Tirol uh, is the best possible start. Uh, as you all know, uh, we all have studied on Jean's uh, many articles, many, many articles, uh, and excellent books. And uh, I feel almost embarrassed to have to present Jean because he needs uh, clearly no introduction. I mean, Jean, uh, to me, uh, joins the best of the European tradition and training and the best of the US tradition and training. So he's uh, like, a, a, in a way, a, a model uh, uh, for all of us. He, uh, in his work, uh, he has uh, joined the rigor of uh, uh, the French uh, mathematical economics tradition and engineering tradition, I would say, and uh, the uh, uh, more maybe down to earth and uh, uh, fact driven, um, uh, issue driven uh, approach uh, of uh, the American uh, research uh, model. And uh, as, as you all know, his uh, basic training is from France, and then he got a PhD from, uh, from MIT. And uh, after that, uh, his uh, first part of his career has been mostly devoted, not only devoted, but mostly devoted uh, to uh, issues uh, in uh, uh, industrial economics, uh, economics of regulation and uh, taxation, uh, especially associated with Jean-Jacques Lafont. Uh, and other colleagues uh, in Toulouse, and uh, he gave us, uh, uh, on top of many, many articles, the beautiful uh, book on uh, industrial organization. It's a major reference for uh, all of us. But uh, then, in a kind of typical fashion, Jean moved across fields, and every time he moved to a new field, not only he produces a slate of, uh, say, 10 to 15 top articles in top journals that became uh, landmarks in that uh, area, but also so eventually he produces the book in that area, like, for instance, uh, in the theory of finance, uh, not only, uh, which is uh, one of the fields, of course, with which uh, I'm more familiar, Jean not only produced a fantastic set of papers together, for instance, with Bengt Holmstrom and so on, but then uh, uh, out of the chaos of the corporate finance literature, he produced a, a kind of set of unifying models, or mainly a unifying model that allowed us to see through the uh, you know, intricacies of uh, the different sets of assumptions and the different um, the, the different um, notations also that the economists were using in the different papers. And this, he has done this repeatedly, settling in a way one field after another. And I hope there will be something left for all of us to do research after Jean passes through these fields. Of course, uh, so it is uh, fantastic to have him uh, blessing the beginning of this uh, 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 new institution. I think this is, uh, I'm happy that this happens in Naples, but I'm mainly happy that this happens at all, because I think it's, uh, um, you know, largely overdue that we have a job market uh, in Europe, just as we uh, have had it for many years uh, in the United States. I think it is uh, uh, a little bit strange to have so many institution, European institutions having to go to the United States to hire mostly European researchers. It's, uh, you know, then high time that we have this uh, here. So without any further ado, let me give the floor to Jean uh, for his uh, Lecture. Thank you, Jean. Well, good morning, and thank you, Marco, for those very, very kind words, and uh, thank you, Iliana, for having me. Uh, it's a great honor to be giving this uh, this first lecture, and and also I'm very excited about the job market. Uh, I arrived only yesterday night, I'm afraid, but uh, what I saw this morning was extremely good, and I'm very happy being a deeply convinced European. I'm very happy that uh, this has been done and it seems to be successful, so that's very good news. And thank you, thank you to, to the European Economic Association officers and the local organizing committee and, and Gemma and, and all the others who have made that a success. So let me talk about this paper with uh, Mohamed Saleh, who is a young colleague of mine in, in Toulouse and uh, taxing identity and fiscal policy and conversion in early Islam, which is, as you know, my area of expertise. Um, so 
Um, I'll tell you about the genesis of this paper. It's not only because Mohamed is a, is a wonderful researcher and is, is in the same corridor as, as I am, but there are also other reasons for that. Um, so what we do more generally is to study a situation in which a group faces a discrimination, maybe price discrimination like a tax or non-price discrimination like slurs or local public goods or you know, some specific tax which is actually uh, geared at them and targeted to them uh, on the basis of some kind of identity. So the identity we are going to focus on today is a religious identity, but it could be racial, it can be ethnic, economic, uh, maybe some uh, political opinions or whatever, but uh, it exposes a ruler or, or the organization to a dilemma between basically extracting the minority's willingness to pay for keeping the identity and uh, running the risk of losing the contribution of this minority uh, through conversion, quit, or exit. Exert. So um, when I talk about minority, it may not be the number, you know, in terms of number, but it might be in terms of power, political power, basically. Okay? So an example of that, the lead example will be a poll tax, uh, which is paid by the member of religious community. I mean, the Jews have been paying that for centuries, starting with the Roman uh, Empire uh, through the 19th century. Um, the Catholics um, in Germany, for example, at the rise of Protestantism. Uh, the Copts, which in Egypt, I'll come back to Egypt because that's going to be the unpackable part of the paper. But of course, uh, in some regimes, you cannot price discriminate. So you cannot levy a tax on someone because of his or her religious identity. So uh, sometimes it, you use non-price instruments to discriminate. Um, so for example, the, uh, it might be local public goods or all kinds of racial slurs. Um, so you probably know this paper by Gleiser and Schleifer on the Curly strategy where the Anglo-Saxon uh, Protestant uh, people were driven out. He was the mayor of Boston for almost 50 years. And basically he, he was representing the Catholic uh, Irish community and basically kicked out through various uh, methods uh, the Anglo-Saxon Protestant uh, people to the suburbs that dates back from them, and there are many examples like that. Uh, there are non-discriminatory taxes like in Turkey in 1942 where basically it was like a wealth tax, but of course who, who had the wealth at the time? There were, they were various uh, communities which were uh, minorities which were richer than the others. But it's a more general thing. I mean, when you have a colleague who doesn't agree with your views, um, there's always a trade-off somehow between trying to convince your colleagues to, uh, to, to adhere to your views and risking the, the risk of their leaving the organization with the disruption that it will create, um, policies toward migrants, there are lots of cases like that. So our lead example will be uh, the fiscal policy in the early Islam. So as you know, after the prophet's death in 16, 600, 632, then you know, the territories of Egypt, uh, Iraq, and Syria were basically invaded. There was no Muslim there, absolutely zero Muslim. Uh, so the Arabs in, invaded those, those countries, in court. Um, and they were, in the case of Egypt, they were almost entirely cops, and there were a few Jews and so on. But let's say they were almost entirely cops. Um, and they started uh, imposing a, a poll tax. A poll tax, I'll, I'll go back into that, but the poll tax was basically if you, want, if you didn't want to convert to Islam, you had to pay a per capita tax. The men had to pay a per capita tax. Um, and the non Muslim um, shrunk from 100% to 16% you know, within five centuries, or almost six centuries. Um, and there was very little migration at the time. There are other cases, of course. You know, if you take dramatic, dramatic examples like the Jews in Germany in the 1930s, obviously there was a lot of, of migration and, and other things. But um, then there was the, the they, they could have been coercion, but what you observe in Egypt was not that, none of that. It was just a price instrument. So it, it's a typical monopoly pricing prime in a sense. Um, and with a very important specificity, and that's going to be extremely important for the dynamics I'm going to cover, is the apostasy. And it's, it was true in all religions, but you know, if you were, if you are Muslim, then you and your, your children and so on are, are Muslims, and you know, if you convert back, 
then the death penalty is waiting for you. Uh, so it's called, an, we will call that an absorbing state. If you're Muslim, you stay Muslim, right, by and large. Uh, we could discuss that because there are interesting is examples like in Spain in the 16th century and 17th century, but you know. Um, so so there, was a, there were a discriminatory tax and a uniform tax. Um, a little complication of the discriminatory tax at the start until 750 was both a poll tax, which is a tax for being non-Muslim, plus a discriminatory land tax. So if you, if you are not a Muslim, if you are copt, uh, you will pay a land tax called the Kahar, which was actually higher than the land tax which was paid by the Muslims, um, which was the Ushur. And you know, the difference between the two has to be added to the poll tax to get the total poll tax, in a sense. Now, by 750, there was a tax reform, which has actually is a big controver controversy among historians. But there was this tax reform, which set up a new uh, Islamic tax system in which basically the Ushur tax became the Karash tax. And on top of that, this Karash tax ceiling was lifted and, and could be increased. And we'll talk a lot about that because that's important in the empirical part. Um, but you know, at, from that date on, basically the discriminatory tax was equal to the, to the poll tax. Okay? And then this new Islamic tax system was, was in force uh, until the 19th century. Um, Mohammed, uh, in an earlier paper, which is very interesting, I really recommend that paper, basically showed that the poll tax, as you might expect, was regressive. Um, so basically, the, the cops, which were richer, of course, could afford paying the, 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 cop ta the, the poll tax. And you know, there was a self-selection in who actually converted to Islam. Um, and actually, the cops, you know, shrank as a, a number, but they became per capita richer than the Muslim, you know, by and large, by a large amount. Um, and that's uh, something which is very, very, very important. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that today, um, but that's one thing. Um, now, something that uh, intrigued us actually is uh, some some sites, some quotations that uh, actually you might be on the wrong side of the left curve. So the poll tax is just like a tax. You know, if you put it too high, it actually might reduce the total revenue, right? So you might be on the wrong side of, of the left curve. So, you know, this uh, Umar II uh, caliph um, says, Muhammad was sent as a prophet, not as a, as a tax collector. That means that um, there is a conflict between converting people and raising tax revenue. Um, so that means, in a sense, that you're on the wrong side of the Laffer curve, because if you're on, on the upward sloping side of the Laffer curve, you can raise a tax, convert more people, and at the same time have more revenue. Uh, the other one is, is in the same, uh, same idea. The answer lies in, in the early fiscal system, and the problem it faced trying to ensure a continuous source of fiscal income while uh, converting people. Okay, so. That's what we are going to, uh, one of the things we are going to look at is whether you were on the wrong side of the left curve. Okay? Um, so we, we develop a little theory about optimal taxation, which might be useful for many other contexts, and I will emphasize that at the end. Uh, but empirically, uh, we look at whether the discriminated tax was on the downward sloping side of the left curve and why. And, you know, and then we look at, um, at why we had a, a uniform tax uh, increase and a change in the uh, Islamic system in 750, because it, they could have done that right away. Presumably, there's a fixed cost of changing the Islamic tax system, but they waited until 750 to do that. And the question is why. And we'll, we'll have four possible explanations, and empirically, we'll select the last two. You know, we can, the data are not good enough to really tell them apart, but uh, trying to basically uh, think. Um, let me start with theory. Of course, with the empirical part, uh, I'm a little bit out, outside my comfort zone. Um, maybe I was telling Iliana and, and Marco, maybe 
it's good to to build uh, confidence uh, in in the younger people. You know, if this guy can get a Nobel Prize, I can get a Nobel Prize too. Um, anyway, I'm going so. If I last long enough on the theory front, um, maybe I, I will escape that, that thing. But I would like to talk about the empirics because they are interesting, and, and, and I'll try to do that. So we have two, uh, two groups, a favor group and possibly unwanted group. And this uh, thing of them as being the cops, actually I'm going to use the religious denominations to, to actually illustrate the model. Um, there is a willingness to pay to keep the identity, which will cause CETA which we think of as being positive. So they are cops and they would like to remain cops, most of them. Um, and there is a distribution, F of theta, with, with standard assumption on the hazard rate. So, so the distribution, there are people who are more or less religious, okay? So I theta person is someone who is more religious. Um, and the taxes, there are two taxes. One is, um, is to a uniform tax on land, and the other one is a discriminate, discriminatory tax tau. So paid only by the non-Muslims, okay? Um, by the way, it's a very simple tax system, but in our context, it's going to be an optimal tax system. You can think of many other ways to force con con conversion, right? So you can think about cohesion. You can think about other kinds of things, uh, local public goods and so on. Um, you can make them consistent with the model if you want, but it's not optimal. So if you can use a, it's a standard thing, if you can use a price instrument, don't use inefficient instruments, right? So as I say, in some application of the model, you cannot have that because you are not allowed formally to price discriminate. So you do it indirectly through local public goods and various other methods. But in this model, it's going to be optimal actually to have, uh, to have this tax system with a uniform tax lambda paid by everyone and a discriminatory tax down, okay? So if you think about the utility of a copt, okay? Um, and by the way, there were only cops. There were no Arabs um, to start with, almost none. Um, so in the static version of the model, um, the utility of, uh, of someone who has religiosity theta is minus lambda if you convert because you don't have to pay uh, the um, poll tax. But if you don't convert, if you maintain your identity, you have to pay the land tax and you have to pay the poll tax on top of that. And then, of course, you keep, you get the benefit of remaining copped if you want to remain copped. Okay? So, of course, in that case, the people who are going to remain copped are the people with the highest religiosity. So, if Sita is greater than Tau, uh, they will remain copped. If Sita is less than Tau, they will convert to Islam. Okay, so theta star equals star will be the cutoff, um, and the, the 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 amount of conversions uh, the con will be a, a mass f of theta star, where f is the CDF of theta. Okay, you can extend things uh, to social incentive like social norms. So, for example, you might uh, um, you know if if you convert, you might be frowned upon by the community. You might say, hey, this guy is not a real cop and actually he's converting, so it's, it's a bad thing. Um, so, you, you know, the, the, the stigma of converted versus the glory of a remaining cop. You can think about network anxiety is a bit different. So the network anxiety is simply you feel stronger maybe if you are in a bigger group. Um, so there might be network anxiety in that way. Social norms, network anxiety can be added to the model, but I'm not going to do that today. So... I told you about the Laffer curve. So the Laffer curve, you just define the revenue from the poll tax. Um, R of tau is equal to tau, which is a tax, my, times the number of people who actually remain copped, one minus F of tau, okay? So we'll call tau M, M for monopoly, of course, um, the uh, one, the level that maximizes this revenue, okay? So you, you have tau M is the top of the Laffer curve. Um, and then you are on the downward sloping slide of the Laffer curve, side of the Laffer curve, if tau is greater than tau m, okay? Um, now, what is a ruler subjective function? So we need to explain a little bit what's going on here. So it's going to be, we're going to just suppose it in a very general terms, uh, very abstract terms. It's just a function of theta star, so how many people you convert, at minus lambda. So, um, 
So think about the first interpretation is lambda is just uh, born by any uh, Muslim. By the way, I will use Muslim and convert equivalently because, as I said, there are very few Arabs uh, to start with, so, you know, people who moved into Egypt. It's many, the Muslims in Egypt are, are reconverts. Um, so basically, you don't like uh, the, the converse to pay the land tax. We take it that to be linear because it's just simpler. Um, but, um, but V of, of Sita star is your motivation to convert people. So first example, extrinsic motivation. So imagine, for example, that the ruler, wherever he is, Baghdad or so, it has moved around, but um, he actually likes to have conversions, right? So you, you have a cost of you know, keeping people uh, cops, right? So you might think, for example, V of Sita star is equal to minus C uh, times the number of people. I, I of course, normalize the number of uh, the population to one, uh, the number of people who actually don't convert, okay? So there is a cost C per, per copt. Um, so you can think about a more religious ruler as being someone with has higher C. Or you could have, for example, um, some kind of uh, utilitarian preferences, but with different weights. So you don't know CETA, you don't know the type of each particular uh, individual, but you don't like people who are strong believer in, in the Coptic religion. So you are going to put on their utility U of CETA, remember U of CETA is, is this expression there, um, you are going to put on their utility U of CETA a weight which depends on their religiosity. So delta is an increasing function of, um, of theta. So if someone is more religious in the Coptic sense, you put less weight on that person, okay? And then you, you, get, you get, when you do the computation, you get something that depends on theta star. So the function V of theta star is equal to this. So basically, just to tell you, you get a rent which is theta minus theta star if you are more religious than, than, than the cutoff. And then it's weighted by this uh, discriminatory weight on, on religious people. So that's another example of the function V. But you, you have other examples that we develop in the paper. So for example, you might care about the number of, of children. Uh, you might care about cohesiveness. You can have various other things. So ruler one will be more religious than ruler two if V prime one is greater than V prime two. So if you are more eager at the margin to convert people. Okay, that's what it means. By the way, I don't know if you you want to ask questions. Uh, I don't know. This is a first lecture, so I don't know what the rule is. But uh, if you if you want to ask questions, please feel free to ask questions because you know, it's it's not a big room, so we can. Okay. No. Okay. Uh, okay. Another interpretation of W is is completely different. There is no land tax. But it's more like an autocratic government or tax farmer who is going to collect the tax out of Tau. So you basically impo impose a poll tax on, on, the, on the cops. And then you have, to, uh, you have to pay B to the caliph. So you have to send a budget B to the caliph. I'm, I'm going to come to, back to that. But basically, they, in that case, there is no land tax. Uh, but the ruler is going to keep the residual revenue once... Uh, Yes, and I can, I'm not going to use he or she because at the time it was clearly a he all the time. Uh, but, um, you know, it's uh, basically sending back to the Caliph B, okay? So you, you, you can still have some motivation because you might still uh, want to convert people, but you also keep the cash. So that's, that's equivalent to this model. It's less relevant for Egypt, but it might be very relevant uh, for other countries. So the budget country, I'm coming back to that. So basically think about the caliph asking for a budget B. And then this budget is going to be covered by the land tax and the discriminated tax, uh, the poll tax. Okay, so you, have, you, have, you need to use a uniform tax or the discriminatory tax to cover what you, what you uh, send to the caliph. By the way, it's really an approximation because in practice, the tax was collected I'll come back to that to the district. So probably the the governor in Egypt, you know, was sending some money back to the caliph, but was also, um, you know, 
putting targets. So we have an extension on that, basically, which might be dependent on the characteristic of the district. Um, so it's actually more complete than that, but you can generalize the results. So once you do that, if you substitute the land tax, remember that, uh, so remember that the, the ruler subject function is V of theta star minus lambda, so you substitute for the land tax and then you maximize the combination of the revenue you get from those who remain corrupt and your intrinsic objection in incentive to convert, which is V of theta star. Okay, so it's, it's not rocket science. You just maximize and you get uh, V prime of, oh, there is a star missing, V prime of theta star plus R prime of theta star equals zero, and then the land tax is determined by this. So if those two equations give you the, the pole tax, tau equals theta star, and the land tax, okay? So, for example, I mean, this is very straightforward, but for example, if you have a more religious leader, then um, if, this, if, if the leader is more religious, so gets a higher utility from converting at the margin, then this leader is going to impose a higher poll tax and is going to convert more people, okay? But furthermore, if you are on the downward sloping side of the Laffer curve, um, then you're also going to tax the converse higher because you want to impose a higher poll tax. So if you're on the wrong side of the curve, you're going to reduce the revenue. You have to make up for this revenue by increasing the land tax. And that's going to be important for the empirical part of the paper, which is, you know, you have to make up for it. So if you are very religious, actually, you're going to hurt your own people, right? Because you want to, to tax the cops a lot, but then you reduce the revenue, you're on the wrong side of the Africa curve, and therefore you have to increase the uniform tax, which is paid by the, conver the converts as well. So it's a very simple result, but you know, it's, uh, empirically it's, it matters. Okay? Same thing if you, if you um, this is by the way, <laughs> This is, by the way, the uh, inverse Laffer curve uh, because lam it's lambda equals B minus R of theta star. Um, if, you can, if you put a, a ceiling on the land tax, um, then you have to move toward, um, because you cannot cover any uh, change in the poll tax revenue through so the land tax is going to change, to change as well the, the poll tax. So for example, if you're on the wrong side of the Laffer curve, remember that the inverse Laffer curve, uh, you would like to be maybe at this point here. But if you have a cap on the land tax, you actually have to reduce uh, the poll tax as well. Okay? So that's, that's the kind of simple result you can get. Now, yes, Ilya. Well, here you, you just don't know what, what their type is. So, you know, I don't know how religious you are. So, I, ca I want to exploit your willingness to pay to remain cops, okay? Therefore, I'm going to try to raise the tax, but I, I just don't know. It's going to be distorsive anyway, because, you know, people are going to convert. It's inefficient, right? Because anyone, someone with type theta positive, so prefers to remain cop converts, there's a dead weight loss, right? But you want to extract the money from those. And so it's, it's like monopoly pricing, really. It's like monopoly pricing. You're going to uh, raise a tax, but you know, if you raise the tax too much, you're going to lose revenue. But there's no way, given that you don't know CETA, you don't know how religious each individual people, each individual is, there's no way you can avoid the distortion. On the labor supply, we don't really have a labor supply anyway. So the, we, the land, by the way, we assume implicitly here that everybody has the same amount of land, which is not correct. But we don't have any data on that. So I'm simplifying things a lot. Um, 
But there's no way you can, actually, we are going to bring evidence that actually you're on the wrong side of the Raffer curve. So, you know, there's no way you can, you can avoid that. Um, possible to infer from the amount of discriminatory tax how religious the leader is? Yes, we are, we are going to do exactly that. Actually, we are going to work the reverse because we have data on how religious the leader is. And then we are going to uh, infer something about the poll tax and therefore about the land tax as well. So it's exactly what we are going to do in the empirical part, I mean, half of the empirical part. Okay. So. One of the things that was of concern, of course, to the caliphs at the time was rebellion. You know, so the question is whether the Arabs actually could survive in Egypt. It was not completely clear. So you have to, um, and I'm sure Eliana will lo you love that. With, you know, the political economy part of it is, is of course, very important. Which is, um, so th we assume that there is a cost of rebellion, ro. So if you, if you want to take part in a rebellion, it costs you a row. But you have to be enough, there must be enough of you to rebel, to succeed. Okay? So we assume that you need at least one minus f of sita hat to rebel. Now, implicitly, those who are going to be more incentivized to rebel are the people who are more religious. I'm going to show that in a minute. But intuitively, if you are more religious, you have more incentive to rebel. Um, so basically, we assume that it's a very simple model of rebellion, that you need enough people to rebel successfully. Um, but if you have enough people who want to rebel, we, don't, we assume there is no coordination failure, because you always have this coordination failure possibility. So, so basically, um, if there are at least one minus f of theta hat, so all types above theta hat want to rebel, then they will rebel successfully. There is no coordination issue. On the wrong side of the Laffer curve, and you push the tax so high that eventually you have to push up also the tax on on the Arabs. At that point, you could have Mar a coalition. Mar Marco, I stop you. You are too fast. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, of course. And actually, the, the concern at the start was the cops rebelling, and actually there, there there were a few rebellions later on, which involved both cops and converts. Exactly, but I'm, I'm going to come to that. Yes, yes. Yeah. So this is a static part. I'm going to go to, to the dynamic part. Um, so, um, so basically, look at the gain from rebellion. So if, you, if your type is sita less than tau, so you're not very religious, you're going to convert, your gain is lambda plus sita. Because if, you, if the rebellion is successful, you won't have to pay the uniform tax who is going to go to the caliph. And you won't, have, you won't lose your religion. You won't have to convert at all. Um, if theta is greater than tau, then you, you are going to save both tax. Anyway, you are going to keep your religion, but you, have to, you will be able to save both taxes. Okay? And the no-revolt constraint is that the gain for the marginal type you remember, you need one minus f theta hat to rebel. And by the way, you see that actually the, the gain from rebellion is increasing weakly in the type. So the more religious people have more incentive to, to, to rebel. Okay. And the no revolt constraint. So, uh, you know, concerning Marco's question, we are going to assume that the caliph has perfect information about those gains and therefore can just prevent the rebellion, which is a standard thing. Now, in practice, of course, there is asymmetric information, incomplete information about the distribution of types, for example, and then you always run the risk of having some kind of revolt. And actually, there were some, but there were. They, as you might imagine, uh, they didn't last very long. Um, so the gain, here's the gain G of theta, which is just saying the same thing. G of theta, uh, so you look at the, so, in order to have a successful rebellion, you need all those types here to rebel. Rho, uh, so if you want to prevent people from rebelling, you must be, make sure that, for example, if the marginal rebel is a convert, that rho um, is 
be greater than lambda plus eta hat, okay? So that's, that's a constraint. In the case where the marginal rebel, we, we do both cases, but in the case where the marginal rebel is a convert, then it must be the case that lambda plus eta hat is less than rho. Okay, so that's very simple. Now, what do you conclude out of that? Imagine that it becomes a little bit easier to rebel, so rho goes down, for example. Or it might be the case that, that theta hat uh, uh, goes up or something like that. But let's, let's assume rho goes down. Then, obviously, you know, from this constraint, you have to reduce the land tax, the uniform tax. Now, you reduce the uniform tax. That means, that means you need more poll tax revenue. You have to offset because you have to send the money to the caliph. So you need more poll tax revenue. Um, but if you are on the wrong side of the Laffer curve, then you're also going to uh, reduce the tax on, on COPs, okay? Because you have to make up for the land tax revenue. Um, so that means that you are going to reduce a tax which is not even paid by the marginal rebel, but it's just you know, the equilibrium and you have to make sure that the budget is covered. Dynamics. So let me let me tell you a little bit about dynamics because it's it's actually interesting. And let me tell you the story about uh, this paper. Um, I was a big fan of uh, of Mohammed's uh, earlier paper, and I was discussing this paper with him. But you know, at some point, I said, "Your know, typical serious remark. Your data don't make sense. <laughs> you know, and part of his data would not make sense. Uh, they they contradict the theory." Um, and, I, and they said, oh, God, <laughs> my goodness. <laughs> and, then, and then I went back home that night and said, my goodness, I'm completely stupid. Um, I told Mohammed something which was completely wrong. Because what I had in mind was, you know, standard theory of dynamics with negative selection. You know, basically it's a durable good monopolist, uh, dynamic bargaining, repeating a Kerloff model with common values and, and, and so on and so forth, you know, what we have learned over decades. And then I started realizing that was one of the many cases of positive selection. What do I mean by negative selection and positive selection? Um, what I mean by that is that uh, negative selection, you are left over time with people who have a lower willingness to pay for interacting with you. So in the case of uh, durable gold monopolist or bargaining, for example, you know, if the person has not agreed with you, you know, by DT, that means that this person has a low willingness to pay. Now, here is the reverse. The people you are staying with over time are the people with a higher willingness to pay, high theta, because the others have converted. So you are playing a game basically with, with the remaining cops. Those are the high theta people. Okay? Fine. What I didn't realize at the time is that um, you know, the dynamics are completely different. So I was commenting on Mohammed's data basically by using a model which was completely wrong for the environment. I apologize, of course, to Mohammed. <laughs> uh, but you know, this is actually uh, very, very interesting. And, and you know, the dynamics are actually much, much simpler with positive selection. So basically, when you keep the highest willingness to pay, uh, people over time, and there are many, many ex examples of that. So in an organization, by definition, you are left with the people who have the highest willingness to pay to be in your organization. You know, with your partner, obviously, if your partner has been around for a long time, that's good news, right? <laughs> and so on and so forth, you know, you can go on and on. Uh, there are actually lots of cases where you have positive selection, whereas in economics we have studied always the, the, the complicated case of, of adverse selection. Why is that much easier with positive selection? Um, so we, what we do in, uh, is basically look at uh, a sequence of taxes now, because and without commitment. By the way, there is absolutely no commitment, of course, in, at the time. Um, so basically, you have a, each period T, you have a poll tax and a, and a land tax, a uniform tax, and you have this very important constraint, which is the apostasy constraint. So if you convert, you cannot convert back. That's it. Otherwise, you're dead. Of course, you know. In other applications, that may not be the case. So, you know, we have seen people leaving an organization or department and coming back. So that exists. You see people divorcing and actually remarrying, right? There's, 
but you know, by and large, you see people migrating to different countries and sometimes coming back. That's possible, you know, but it's unusual because there are high transaction costs for that. Um, so, and of course, there is a signaling part, which is important. So, positive selection means that actually, in this kind of environment, it's not always the case, but you know, in most environments, actually, the behavior of the agent is going to be completely very simple. It's going to be myopic. It's optimal. It's unlike the durable good monopolies. You know, you wait for the price of the book to fall or the movie to to fall, right? Here, you just behave myopically. That makes things very simple. So, basically. What you can show then is that, why? Because the marginal type won't never, will never get a surplus in the future. The tax will always adjust to a level which is at least the level of the marginal type. So in the end, theta star t will be equal to tau t unless tau t is less than theta star t minus one, which by the way will never be the case, but you know. So, so the question is, does a ruler also behave myopically? And if so, that's really simple because even so people discount the future you know, at a non-zero rate, they still might behave myopically and then it's completely trivial to solve. So first question, does a ruler also behave as if he were myopic? The answer is yes. So both sides behave myopically, so that makes it very simple. Uh, second question is, do conversions occur gradually? So for example, imagine there are two pairs that holds with any number of periods. So for example, if the time, the, var the budget varies over time, so imagine that there are times in which the caliph faces external wars, then you have to increase the a, increase a fiscal pressure. Um, then in that case, there is no reason to uh, change uh, the poll tax, so it's going to be time consistent somehow. You are going to have all conversions starting at the start and you'll adjust the land tax over time. Now, there are more interesting things. So, uh, look at the time varying ruler religiosity. So, you can have, for example, the caliph becoming more religious over time or less religious over time, and actually we have data about that. So, here is, here is a Laffer curve, and not the inverse Laffer curve, R of tau. So, assume first, and just to illustrate the thing, assume first that the, the caliph, it's a different caliph over time. So the caliph becomes more religious over time. So V prime two is greater than V prime one. So you have increasing religiosity, okay? Now, just look at myopic behavior. So the first, the first one, say, you know, here I illustrate the case on the, on the, on the wrong side of the curve, but if it's the upward sloping side, that's fine as well. Uh, the first leader is going to charge some poll tax tau one star. But then the second ruler, who is more religious, is going to charge a higher poll tax, tau two star. And there will be new conversion at that point of time, right? Um, there will be no conversion. And if you are on the downward sl sloping slide of the Laffer curve, there will be an increase in the, and that's going to be very important empirically, there will be an increase in the uniform tax because you have to make up for the lost revenue, right? The new ruler is more religious and is going to impose higher poll tax, that's going to lead to an erosion of the tax base and, and basically less tax revenue. And that means that you have to compensate for with a land, higher land tax. Okay, so here you have gradual conversions and increase in the land tax. Now, assume the reverse, and there is a very asymmetric response to shocks. So imagine now that uh, the first ruler is very religious and the second ruler is not. Okay, so the first, the first leader, the first ruler, is going to impose a high poll tax, star one star, okay? Now, the second ruler would like to have a lower poll tax because he's less religious. However, however, you cannot convert back. There's no way. So actually, given that all the people, theta greater than theta one star, have converted, then you might actually, and it's actually optimal to charge at day two tau one star. So you basically replicate the policy of the first ruler. So you, you do the same thing. So there's a very strong ratchet effect. Basically, if you have decreasing religiosity, then it's the first ruler who is going to determine basically the, the conversion rate, and there will be all the conversion at the start as opposed to, to later on. 
Okay, so they asymmetric asymmetric uh, dynamics. Okay, um, un uncertainty about the muzzling rule. Um, there is no gradual conversion. So here it's an exogenous uncertainty, and now I'll move on to the endogenous uncertainty. So imagine that the caliph might be replaced for whatever reason, but not an internal reason. Um, so there's probably X at day one that the ruler will be evicted at day two, and that was very important early on, around 640, 670, because no one knew actually that the Arabs would be able to stay in Egypt. Later on, X became close to zero. But you know, at the start, X was substantial. So there was a strong possibility that actually the, uh, the caliphate would not be able to stay in Egypt. Um, in that case, the interesting thing is that there is an option value of remaining copt. If you lose your religion, I mean, look, if you lose your religion and the caliph is replaced, then you have lost your religion, uh, but then you, you could have stayed copt, right? So there is this option value, which, of course, is going to make the demand curve more inelastic. So people will be less eager to convert. But, of course, knowing that, there will be an increase in the poll tax because people have higher willingness to pay for remaining COP. And actually, you can show that there's actually no gradual conversion. The poll tax is going to increase in such a way that actually the number of conversion is not going to change with X. Um, so that, that's interesting, but the, given that there will be a high revenue on the poll tax because people are very reluctant to convert given the uncertainty, then the land tax is going to start small and is going to go up over time. Okay, that's the dynamic. And the final point, and then I'll move on to the empirical part. The final point, which is interesting, is that you can have a time decreasing resistance um, to conversion, even if nothing changes. So even in a completely stationary environment, nothing changes over time, the resistance to conversion may go down. So that's an interesting point in its own right. I'm going to assume that people are completely myopic, but that's not important, actually. Uh, I'm still going to assume that you need one mass of Sitaat to rebel to topple the Muslim rule and the individual causes rule. And the big proposition is that conversions uh, weaken resistance. Yeah, the conversions that conver weaken the resistance over time. So it will be possible for the ruler to raise taxes over time. Even so, nothing changes. Okay? And that's going to mean that the, the implication of that is that you can delay the tax system reform because the tax re system reform allowed you to increase taxes um, because of time decreasing resistance. So let me just explain. It's a very simple point. Um, look at the diagram at before, which is here's a gain from rebellion, G of theta. Let's say there are two periods, one and two. It's more general than that. Okay? So remember that it must be the case at the start, let's assume the marginal rebel is a convert, that lambda one plus theta hat is B less than rho. Rho is the individual cost of, uh, of rebellion, theta hat is a marginal rebel. Okay? So it must be the case that the marginal rebel doesn't want to rebel. Okay? So that's, that's the curve, G1 of theta, okay? And, and here is a G1 for, for those who remain copped. Okay, fine. But now look at day two. At day two, people have converted. Those people have converted at least. You know, those with theta less than the, than the poll tax. So that means their gain from rebellion has gone down. Okay? Now, for given for given tax system, they gain because they, they have nothing. They just they economize on the land tax. They have lost their religion anyway, so their incentive to rebel is smaller. They have lost their religion. Okay, so um, so that means that you know they are, they can, you can increase the poll tax if you want, the uniform tax if you want, because their day two gain is only lambda two. It's not lambda two plus theta. Okay, it's because they have lost their religion. So at that point of time, you, um, you end up uh, with a lower resistance, so you, you can increase the uniform tax. And if you increase the uniform tax and you're on the wrong side of the curve, you can also increase the poll tax. 
okay? Which means that you're exerting an externality on, on converse, on non-converse, right? You're exerting an externality on non-converse. So it is a kind of, when you have, when you have the same discounting for the ruler and the agents, basically you, uh, you basically have some kind of divide and conquer strategy. But the very interesting result is that even nothing changes in the economy. Actually, the rebellion threat becomes weaker over time because people have converted. And that means they have less to gain from rebellion because they are not going to get their religion back. That's as simple as that. Okay. So let me move on to the empirics. Um, and I've brought my phone to call Mohammed just in case I have a tough question. Um, no, seriously. The, uh, okay, so what we do is we look at the discriminated tax, tau star, the uniform tax, lambda star, and the number of converse, which is f of theta star. You might say it's the same as, as tau star, but not quite, because, for example, if you move the religiosity of cops, for example, then that's not quite the same. Um, so those are the, the outcomes. Now, the explanatory variables will be the religiosity of, of the tax authorities, which I've called V prime in, uh, in the theoretical part. So, for example, if you have more religious uh, authorities, then they are going to increase the discriminatory tax, you are you're going to increase the number of converts, and if you are on the wrong side of the Laffer curve, you are going to increase the land tax. So yellow means that the result is reversed depending on whether you are in the upward sloping or downward sloping of the Laffer curve, side of the Laffer curve, okay? So that, that's basically it. Um, if you increase the budget, it's going to be absorbed through the land tax, um, no impact on discriminatory tax, okay? Uncertainty about the measuring rule, which I call X. Um, if people want to keep their option value of remaining copped, you are going to basically increase uh, the discriminate tax. It's not going to have any effect, as I said, on the number of converts, but it's going to mean that you are going to reduce the uh, uniform tax because you make a lot of revenue. Cop religiosity, I haven't talked about, you can do that. The threat of rebellion, which is something I discussed uh, earlier, has also some implication on, and, and the cap on the uniform tax. So let's take, for example, the cap on the uniform tax. So if you, if you have a higher cap, a lower cap, so lambda, lambda bar goes, goes down, then you can raise less money through the uniform tax. So you have to make more poll tax revenue, um, which means that if you're on the wrong side of the Laffer curve, you have to decrease the poll tax. If you're on the right side, um, right side, on the upward sloping side of the Laffer curve, you get exactly the reverse. So the yellow means that the implication is reversed when you are on the upward sloping side of the Laffer curve, okay? So we, ha we have testable implications. So we look at two things. We look at local, local level evidence on the outcome, and then we look at, uh, at, uh, at the aggregate stuff, okay? Now, the data, of course, are you know, limited. Uh, Mohammed has done incredible work you know, there is a huge literature in, I haven't talked about in history on, on Egypt and the, the early Muslim era, period in Egypt. Uh, and he is re is changing the, the views of the profession on, on that particular thing. So he has done a wonderful job, but you have to realize, of course, that the data of uh, seven, eight, and nine century and so on are not, not, uh, not perfect, okay? So, for example, how do you measure conversions? Uh, it's pretty difficult because there was no no clear data on that. So what Mohammed did in his earlier paper was to look at uh, measuring at the village level. So there are districts that are called the Kuras. And then within each district, uh, there are villages, which may be bigger than villages, but they are called villages, OK? Um, and uh, the village level data on Coptic church and monasteries uh, in 1200, so it's long after, but you know, he argues in his earlier paper that actually a fair amount of uh, hysteresis on that. So basically, if you have copy, Coptic churches and monasteries, that means that the presumption is that there's been few conversions. If there have been a lot of conversions, then you won't get them anymore. Um, tax rates, 
Um, so we need data on uh, poll tax, caras, and carash tax, uh, Usho tax, which is uh, uh, the land tax which was levied until 750, actually was very small. Actually, there are, there are even doubts about whether it was collected. Um, so the problem is that, of course, lots of those uh, data, the Papihai uh, data, have, have disappeared. So actually only four uh, Kuras uh, were, were left. So you have a, approximately 45 villages per Kura. So it's about 180 villages overall. Um, you know, this is, um, but, but you have tax registers, which um, have been digitized, and you get the receipt and so on. So you, you look at, uh, at, at those data, which is data on Tau and Lambda, basically. Um, and, you know, a couple of, of caveats, of course, is that, you know, it's sometimes it's very difficult to date uh, the papyri exactly and and so on and and then the um, the carage is is supposed to be the same for every person but you you will not expect the land holdings to be exactly the same for everyone and so on so there are a bunch of uh, of caveats and he also has a uh, assembled total tax revenue uh basically uh but later on and again he, he, there's some argument that there is hysteria on that. So, um, what do we do? Um, we focus on the effect of religiosity of ta local tax authorities because uh, there are different levels of religiosity, of course, at the caliph level, and also, uh, so there will be, for example, the extrinsic incentive provided by the caliph to convert people will depend on the caliph, but it will also depend on the local authorities because the collection of taxes was done at the local level by village admin and so on at the start. And then, um, now, tax administration was decentralized, so first you had no Arabs, almost uh, basically the Coptic elites, then Arab penetration, and finally they went on to tax farming, but that's not of much interest to us here. Um, but basically, what Mohammed did was to, digit, to basically say, um, to have a dummy variable saying, you get variable one if the Kura receive Arab settlers and, and zero if, if not. Now you might think about Arab, Arab settlement not to be random, right? You could have some endogeneity of Arab settlements. Um, so, I'm going to tell you, uh, are we, you know, what, what instrument we use for that. But um, we also have a number of control variables, cop religiosity. How do we know cop religiosity? So in a sense, the F, the distribution F, can be shifted across uh, local places. But if you were on the route of the Holy Family, presumably it was more religious. Uh, there are data on cop income, there is, uh, and so on. Th there are other parameters which are un unlikely to vary locally, like uncertainty about the caliph rule, for example, or the threat of rebellion, because if you have to rebel, it's not a Kura which is going to be rebel, it has to be all over Egypt, and so on. And same thing, the cap, the cap on uniform tax. So we look at conversion tax, uh, tax revenue, uh, as a function of, for example, Arab settlements uh, and various control variables. Um, let me just talk about uh, the IV for, for settlements. So Arab settlements may not have been random, but the idea is that Arabs settle more close to the entry into Egypt, which is the Irish, um, and they like to border deserts. So, you know, so, so they didn't, obviously, they, they, for geographical regions, they settle more in some region than others. So that's, that's an instrument we use for to control for the endogeneity of uh, Arab settlements. So here are findings. Um, conversions are higher when you have more Arab settlement, as you would expect, because they are more religious than the Coptic elites, of course, who, who levy the tax on behalf of the Arabs. Um, they were fewer when you had a more religious Copt community, which again is something that you would expect. The poll tax is higher when you have an Arab settlement. Again, that's uh, to be expected. And higher when you have a more religious cop, cop community. Again, that's confirm, uh, that fits with the theory. Uh, poll tax revenue, and that's something which is going to help us. 
uh, that if you have an Arab settlement, you have a lower poll tax revenue. And that really strongly suggests that you're on the downward sloping side of the Laffer curve. Why? Because if you have an Arab settlement, you're going, as shown uh, above, you're going to tax more the COPs. So if you're on the wrong side of the Laffer curve, you're going to decrease the revenue of the poll tax. So you're you basically, overall, are going to get a less poll tax revenue. For that, you need a little bit of an extension of the model, but that works. Um, same thing that suggests being on the downward sloping side of the Laffer curve is that the uniform tax was higher when you had an Arab settlement. Okay? I, I told you, when you have an Arab settlement, you have more poll tax. If you're on the wrong side of the Laffer curve, you're going to have less tax revenue from the poll tax, and therefore you have to increase the, poll, the, the uniform tax. So that evidence basically suggests that um, we were on the wrong side of the Laffer curve. Okay? Um, it's higher when you have more adjust COP community and you have something also which fits with the theory on total tax revenue. Um, then we move on uh, to country level evidence. And you know, it's even more qualitative than, than, than the rest. Uh, because we observe outcome at scattered uh, points of time. But the big question we ask is why is that, that the caliphate and the ruler in Egypt waited until 750 to change the tax system? So the tax system, remember, changed in two ways. The first was to say that the converts will pay the cash tax, which was the higher tax, land tax. And furthermore, the cap on the cash tax was raised. So basically, this tax reform allowed you to raise lambda, period. Okay? Now, there are four possible explanations from the theory. The one is that the caliph, the caliph um, religiosity increased. Because if the caliph religiosity increases, then this caliph is going to increase, is going to push. Uh, the, the tax collector to increase the poll tax, and therefore, um, if you're on the wrong side of the Laffer curve, which is likely, um, is going to reduce revenue, and then you, uh, you have to increase the uniform tax, and therefore you need a tax reform. It could be an increase in the budgetary needs, which to the same effect. It could be a decrease in X, the uncertainty about the Muslim rule, or it could be a decrease in the threat of rebellion. So we have four possible theories with one fact. Okay, so we, we are not going to give an exact answer to that, but we, we are going to rule, rule out two of them. Um, so first, it cannot be an increase in caliph religiosity. How do you know? Well, you just look at whether the caliph was throwing parties. Okay, or you look, uh, like Eric Cheney, Cheney uh, you look at uh, the difference between Standardized difference, uh, the number of religious buildings relative construction of religious buildings relative to secular buildings. So you have multiple measures of religiosity of the caliph. And if anything, you see that actually, um, so, yeah, so basically, if you don't all palace uh, parties like musical and literary parties, that means that you are more religious. And, you know, the, the evidence is is that it doesn't fit with the theory. So it's not, uh, and the data, um, basically the religiosity in stuff increasing went down over time. So that cannot be an explanation. The budgetary need also went down over time. Uh, actually, that you can see from external wars and, and the like. So actually the budgetary, budgetary needs uh, fall over time. Um, so those are not the explanations. We are left with two explanations uh, which we cannot tell apart, and they are very difficult to tell apart. One is that uh, uh, uncertainty about the caliphate's rule has gone down, or the threat of rebellion has gone down, um, either, and we just don't know. Okay? So that's basically the findings. We, we are left with explanation C and D here. Okay? Uh, concluding remarks? Uh, yes. No, of course so not. They don't look completely mutually exclusive. Yeah, no, I, yeah, right. I mean, you are more likely to rebel if you think there is a external threat. So the internal threat and the external threat are probably correlated, I agree. 
there's no way we can tell that apart, but, uh, but you're right. Other, other questions about the Ampere Gold part? If I can answer those questions, of course. No? No form of democracy in, in, in any way, because, of course, to the extent that you know the authority of the caliph were tempered by any form of democracy, people would have probably opted to be not to be on the downward sloping part of the Laffer curve. Uh, even the Arabs would not no. have liked that, I guess, unless they were super religious as well. So. Uh, no, I, that's that's right. I mean, if you had left anyway, if you had left the cops rule the the country, uh, I mean, at the start they were almost 100% of cops, mm. so they would not have voted for a poll tax in the first place. So it, the poll tax would have been zero and was zero before. So it's not even you know beyond Tawem, it's it will be zero if you if you had a democracy, right? Yeah, no, I was wondering whether there would be any like limitation on the power. Uh, of, uh, of, of the caliph. Maybe maybe this is what you mean by the no rebellion constraint. Yes, I, I think that like was the only the thing. The minimal form of democracy that you can have in such a situation. That's right. So, so there was a conquest. It was a military conquest. And then basically the Arabs took over Egypt and greater Syria and, okay. and, so, and Iraq. And then they imposed their rule, including the poll tax. We focus, by the way, on Egypt because that's the only place where there's remaining evidence. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, there was no choice. So the only choice was to rebel. And they needed a lot of coordination to do that. But coming back to your earlier question, you needed to have, uh, at the start, you had rebellions. You know, the attempts at re rebellion were the cops. And then it moved the cops plus the converts, which you will predict. If you extend the theory, we don't do it in a paper, but if you extend the theory to introduce noise about where Sita Hat is, for example, or Ro is, then you'll have on the campus some rebellions. But those rebellions at the start will involve uh, cops, and then later on they will involve cops and converts. That's the prediction. Okay. Okay. okay, so the concluding remarks will be very short, and I may be short of time, but I will welcome any further question. Is that um, so basically we look at a new exercise, a very simple exercise in optimal taxation, um, when the ruler is hostile to the population in both a static and dynamic environment. Um, we argue that the theory is broadly consistent with the evidence, both empirical and historical qualitative, on Islamic taxation in early Islam, um, you know, for the case of Egypt at least, uh, probably the same in other countries as well. Um, but, you know, I will encourage you to actually uh, uh, apply this kind of reasoning to other things because it's all the time that you, as I said, that you, you may actually adopt policies that are going to imply that the minority is going to change its identity, either through conversion or through migration, exit or whatever, um, and you know, trying to measure with, with good data on you know, this kind of thing. So, uh, I doubt that you will have good data on the Roman times. Uh, you know, the Romans actually had a poll tax on, on non-citizens, and in the end, they ended up with only citizens almost. Um, well, I should not probably have much better experts <laughs> on the topic than I am, but uh, your taxation, of course, you know, the early days of Protestant, Protestantism, um, you, had, you had, in Germany, you had conversion of the Catholic into uh, the new religion. And of course, there was a financial incentive for that. The wealth tax in Turkey uh, led to a lot of migration uh, on, you know, in 1942. Uh, today, you can apply that to how you, you treat the migrants. But by the way, one of the things that will have to be done on the theoretical front is also trying to think about um, having multiple rulers. You know, you, you, you have some kind of, uh, you have some rulers who are going to kick out populations. Yeah. 
like the Jews uh, in, in 1492 in Spain and so on and so forth. And you know, those migrate somewhere else where they might be welcome, right? Uh, or, or not. And you know, you, you know, the dynamics, you know, the curriculum dynamics of that will be actually very interesting to, to study, um, both theoretically and empirically, but we have very little to do. But in any case, thanks so much for inviting me. It's a great honor and it's a great pleasure. And if you have any other question, I'll be happy to try to respond. discrimination through not just on the ta on the tax side of the fiscal equation but sometimes you see discrimination also through difference in uh, provision of public services so yeah. an expenditure side of the fiscal equation as well exactly I mean the actually we, we have some stuff about that but you know you can do that with an on price instrument so Precisely because in modern democracies, for example, you're not allowed to say, you know, you're Anglo-Saxon Protestant, then you're going to pay a higher tax. You're not allowed to do that. And therefore, people want to discriminate against people who don't have the same opinion or the same identity, use indirect ways, which are less efficient ways. But they are going to, you know, to alter the, law, the provision of public goods, for example, as you say. So, so it works just the same. It's just a less efficient instrument to discriminate than just a price. So a lot of uh, uh, minority religions also op operate in secret. So this model doesn't seem to capture that, right? You c I can claim that I convert, but secretly it's my own identity. Right. Is there any way to... M right. To Actually, this is a little bit motivating. You're right. I mean, some was in secret, and there was always a doubt, actually. Uh, there are, there are, you know, if you look at, um, for, for example, this... Um, this intrinsic motivation piece is that you don't know who is more or less religious, but you somehow you suspect that some people actually are fake converts, right? They are, they are formerly Muslims. They are, you know, there was a whole procedure actually to become Muslim. However, secretly they remain cops, right? And there were, there's a lot of evidence that. And, and this UT function, for example, takes into account the possibility that they will be fake converts because you always suspect that this, this will happen. Another example is Spain, actually. Um, Spain, uh, as you know, there was conversion to Islam. Um, actually, interestingly, in that case, there were conversions back uh, to, Catholic, to Catholicism. Um, but in the end, uh, there was a big fight uh, between uh, the king and the nobles. I mean, the nobles wanted to be able to, to take advantage of, of those, whereas the king and the church were more religious, and in the end, is in 1600-something, 1609, I don't remember, the Maisco were uh, expelled from Spain. So they were actually Catholics, which were former Muslims, right? Which basically uh, contradicts a little bit my apostasy constraint. <laughs> but anyway, um, we could discuss that at length, because actually it's very, very interesting to, to study that. But, you know... They were expelled, and they were expelled on the grounds that actually they were not real Catholics. Even so, they had converted back to Catholicism. Uh, there was this suspicion by the church in particular and by the king of Spain that actually they were not real Catholics, and, and they were kicked back. Uh, they were expelled from Spain at that point of time. Um, so you are completely right. Um, and that raises the issue also about... Uh, uh, whether you can convert back. In general, you cannot, because if, you know, someone can always kill, kill you because you are Muslim, you convert it back to the Coptic religion, someone can kill you. It's possible. Now, if everybody converts back, that's a little bit different, because then you might say, okay, that's fine. Um, there's still a cost, because, you know, people think, you know, you're not really Catholics because you accepted to convert to Islam in the first place. But, you know, you might not be killed for that. But in the end, what happened in Spain in, in the early 17th century, that they were, they were all kicked out of Spain, of Andalusia. And uh, a question. 
Actually, um, for the non-Muslims, paying the tax actually made them exempt from military service. So, I mean, it might be that uh, the decision to pay a tax and remain non-Muslim might not be a, a measure of religiosity, but actually risk aversion. Okay, so you're right. And, uh, but when you uh, were enlisted for military service, you also uh, got some money out of that. So it's hard to know what the net, net effect was. Uh, so I, I don't know, but uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than what we said. We just focus on, by the way, we just focus on the poll tax, possibly increased by the car until uh, 750. However, however, there were a couple of other taxes, um, and we are, what we argue in the paper, and you know, it's limited evidence, but what we argue is actually it strengthens our case. Because there might, also, there might be other discriminatory taxes, which in the end actually um, makes it even more likely that you will be on the, on the wrong side of the Laffer curve. Um, that's what we argue in the paper now. It's, uh, it's not very strong evidence, but you know, that's a possibility. But you, you are right. I mean, it's, when I said there are two taxes, it's, it's more complicated than that. I mean, I, I'm sweeping stuff on the rug, right? Yes, we know that uh, indeed identity is to some extent endogenous. And uh, what would change into your model if we allow, for example, to a feedback of a discriminatory tax on the identity uh, by way, for example, of uh, oppositional identity formation? Yeah, that's what we, we try to capture maybe naively with this, uh, you know, the... Um, the social incentives, I don't remember where they were, but you know, things like social norms and, and network societies. So the social norm stuff, a little bit like in my work with Roland Benabou, is basically that if you remain copped in this particular application, there is some kind of glory you show to your community that you are actually uh, someone who, who cares about your religion. And conversely, if you um, if you convert, you show that actually you didn't care that much. So there's a difference between the glory of remaining cop and the, the stigma of, uh, of converting. So that might be a social incentive on top of the fiscal incentive. Um, but then the network side is, thing is more complicated because, of course, you know, when you start being in a minority, what does it imply? That means you'll be weaker. Um, or like, just like in the model, you won't be able to rebel as, as easily because, you know, and so on. So there are lots of, uh, lots of social incentives that uh, in principle can fit into the model, but we, we do very little about. Thank you so much. Thank you.